welcome to Beyond Politics. I'm Katherine Clark. Conservative MP Rob Merrifield grew up on a dairy farm in Alberta. It's a farm that's now been in his family for four generations. His parents were active in the community and it's a trait that they passed on to their children. Rob Merrifield served on city council just as his father had done before him. He also ran provincially before he was elected to the Federal House of Commons in 2000. He's been there ever since and Rob Merrifield joins me now to talk all about life beyond politics. Rob Merrifield, welcome to Beyond Politics. It's great to have you here. It's great to be with you, Catherine. I was saying before um, the show when we, when we first met that um, doing research for the show was a real joy because you represent the riding of Yellowhead. That's right. And my dad represented the riding of Yellowhead for years and years. And uh, it, I have such fond memories of being in the riding pretty much every weekend of my life for the first you know, 16 years of my life. And... It was great to see all the old names of all the towns that I spent so much time in, so I'm really thrilled to have you here. Oh, it's, it's great. Uh, it is. Uh, I, I love the riding. The riding is a great rural riding. Uh, I would say the greatest in Canada. I tease my colleagues all the time, the most beautiful riding in, in Canada, and they argue with me until I say, do you have a Jasper in your riding? And exactly. They back away. <laughs> you know, it's so true. Um, Jasper played a... I learned to ski at Marmot Basin, and uh, I, you know, spent... Uh, pretty much every winter break uh, in in Jasper, and um, it is just one of the most beautiful parts of the country. It is the kind of place that gets right into your soul. You know how geography can do that for you. You, you have certain places that really speak to you, and Jasper's always been that for our family. It is. It's one of those places where you, when you first go through Jasper, you say it's spectacular. But what is there to do here? And <laughs> people who live there all their life are saying. You know, they're, they're finding new things all the time. Even, uh, you know, some of the old times are saying, well, I didn't know that was there. I didn't know this was there. It's yeah. spectacular to go see through this. So there's lots there that doesn't meet the eye initially, but it is, you know, a unique place in the world. Yes. You know, um, not to make this a total reminiscing uh, uh, interview, but one of my favorite parts about the drive um, into Jasper was always that at Hinton, it was the last Dairy Queen. <laughs> before you went into the park. <laughs> and so we would always stop at the Dairy Queen in Hinton and get everyone in the van would get a big whatever and off we'd go and that was always something I looked forward to. Uh, yeah. Well, pretty much at least once or twice a month. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it's a developing, I mean the whole area is developing unbelievably. Oil and gas is yeah, driving I it, the uh, fourth sector and so on. Yeah, um, it's a big riding too, isn't it? I Very mean, large. Yeah. We used to have to hop around uh, a lot on, on planes uh, and a lot of driving, but how do you get around? Well, it's six hours corner to corner if right. you're looking at it that way and you have to get around. So driving is still uh, a long distance, but it's uh, easy driving. And there's uh, four-lane highways now all the way through two quarters through Highway 16 and Highway 43. So. Uh, it's actually quite enjoyable to get around in and sure. drive. But um, I bought a new vehicle first of July. Right. I've got 19,000 kilometers on it today. Do you so. really? Oh my gosh. So, how much of your weekend do you spend driving normally? Well, you, when you're in the riding, there's yeah. always events, so it depends on you know, where, where the are. events are, and you try to put in two, three, four, uh, depending on, on the weekend and your right. time and uh, what you can get to. Yeah. It's always a bit of an event in a rural riding. You're a lot closer to the electorate, so because you're in their papers on a weekly basis, sure. so you can keep them up to speed on the issues. And, and that's if they're ever going to get stroked in this job, it's in the riding, not, uh, not over here at the asylum. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah, well, it's been called a number of things. <laughs> it's probably one of the nicest things that's been called an asylum. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you you came. Tell me about your your path to childhood. I mean, um, my understanding is that your family uh, was in farming. You were in farming yeah. for yeah. years. So what was it that, that got you involved in politics? Well, actually, our oldest son has taken over the farm. He's right. fourth generation. So yes. uh, when I got out of college, I was involved in uh, recreational boards or um, health. I, uh, I served as a chair of a hospital board and hospital authority right. for a number of years and then went to uh, also an educational board and um, you know everything from recreation to agricultural committee, uh, committees and then involved in municipal politics and <clears throat> took a bit of a 
uh, run at a primary in, in uh, provincial politics. Oh, yeah, we still hold right. the, the, the record. <laughs> Actually, sure. my opponent myself on, on that front, uh, but that vaulted me into federal politics where I uh, it's been a real, a real pleasure to actually bring, you know, the the right side of the political spectrum together to be able to form government yeah. and lead the country. So, tell me, tell me what it's like for you, um, because you were so active in your community, to now still be very active in your community, but you've got a job that takes you out of the community. Uh, you have, you know, good chunks of time when you're back there, uh, summer for the most part, and, and breaks and such, but. Um, pretty much every week you're on a plane and you're coming here. What is that? Um, what is that like for you? Yeah, it wears on you. I mean, the the most difficult part of the job is the travel. There's, you know, it's ten hours from the time you leave my office here in Ottawa to the time I actually get home, because you're traveling after you land. Uh, that's a, a strain and a drain. But uh, if I couldn't sleep on a plane, I uh, probably would have made it this uh, right. till now. But nonetheless, uh, if my summers are actually quite busy as well because I, I work with the U.S. Congress uh, you know, very aggressively, so I'm either traveling down there or traveling uh, across Canada, North America, or international trade and overseas. So I was in Haiti, Dominican Republic earlier. I'll be in Japan tomorrow, so wow. that's the kind of thing that sounds. That sounds like my schedule. You know, <laughs> Japan tomorrow. And <laughs> wow. Do you do you find it draining? I mean. Or do you just have an, a level of energy that surpasses other people? I just never let uh, jet lag be an excuse. So okay. whenever, whatever the time is, wherever I land, uh, you just set the clock at that. And, and I have the ability to power snooze a little bit if I have to. So good. you're able to move I move actually, along I, I think that's the secret to any good politician is the power snooze. Yeah. I think that that's something that people don't really... Um, understand the power of a power snooze. I've seen a lot of times successful people, they say, don't have to have a lot of sleep or they can they can rest up very quickly, you know, in the back of a car or on a plane or um, at their desk behind a newspaper. <laughs> but I think that's a, a very valuable tool to have. Yeah, I, I tease my colleagues all the time. I say, if you're conscious, right, you can sleep anywhere. <laughs> So I sleep on a plane very well. It's not, uh, and so that's a bit of a downtime to some degree. Right. Uh, some people see it as a stressor. I look at it the other way around, and you have to if you're going to function. Yeah. yeah. Tell me about growing up. Were you a big family? Uh, yes, we have uh, five in the fam fam five siblings in the family. Okay. I have three brothers and a younger sister, so I was the youngest of the four boys. Wow. So we. Uh, was that a good thing? Or was that a I not got good beat thing? up a lot, you know? You? <laughs> but, but no, we had a you know good family life, a good family uh, upbringing on the farm, and right. uh, so it was. Uh, I, I don't feel uh, anything but uh, fond memories of my childhood. Actually, I'm on the same farm right now, so. Are you really living in the same house that you grew up in? Or? Actually, I am. Uh, the house has been built on too, and it's uh, a very nice home. But it uh, it. The original part of the home was built in 1953. So, right. Yeah. So um, this was the farm then of your grandfather, is that right? That's right. He initially started, and my father bought it, and then I, uh, <clears throat> it was passed on to myself and my brother. I bought him out, and then we moved on to where my son is now managing it and yeah. running it. So tell me about your mom and dad. What were they like as people? Oh, they were great people, uh, wonderful community people, but it was different in their era. Um, you know, the house was always open to company and people would come in all the time. There was always time for um, socializing. I might say at that time, life was a little bit slower, but the work was much harder. Right. And more and physical. More physical I mean. yeah. 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 But uh, it was, um, you know, a very close community in a sense of uh, they were always there. Uh, we had a dairy farm at that time and we actually delivered milk to door to door to the community, and wow. so it was a lot of work, but uh, it was a lot of uh, good times. What was your job? What were your chores? On the farm? <clears throat> well, we did a lot of cow milking. I have long arms. I think that was from carrying buckets when I was six years okay. old. So that's my that's my story. <laughs> Uh, we played basketball as a family, uh, all of uh, the boys, actually my uh, younger sister as well. So, in fact, we still play basketball here uh, on the hill. Do you really? Uh, wow. Uh, the game changes. You run slower, shoot straighter as a game plan. You know, right. try it that way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, tell me about the transition uh, from farming to politics. Because, well, I guess the better question would be, had you ever seen a different career path for yourself other than farming? Uh, 
wasn't that I was stuck on farming. In fact, when I was growing up, I said there was only one thing I didn't want to be, and that was and a that farmer. Was a farmer. <laughs> yeah. So you have to be careful of that. But uh, farming has been very, very good to us. Uh, our oldest son, he wanted to farm, take over the farm. So I said, go get a business education, and I would teach him how to farm. And he got his business education. Now he's teaching me how to farm. So it, uh, farming is evolving, changing. It's very... Um, uh, it's, it's actually very scientific, very technical, yeah. and uh, if you're a successful farmer, it's because you're a very sharp uh, business person. Yeah. It's, people don't often see that about farming, do they? I mean, the regular city folk uh, who live in big cities and who uh, go to the grocery store to get um, their food really uh, probably don't have a sense of what's truly involved in a, in a modern farming operation. I, I think that's true. It used to be 80% of uh, Canadians either came directly or were, you know, had rural backgrounds, and now that's uh, changing. Even in our community, which is a rural community, uh, my son last week took uh, a very large combine that we had on the farm into the schools and, oh, and wow. allowed, the, allowed the children to go through this combine. And he's there from 9 till 3. I guess it was quite a hit. But, I'm uh, sure it would be a hit. Yeah. Speaking as the mother of a 3-year-old boy who, even if we're on a highway, I have to pull over to the right-hand lane and drive slowly when we go by combines. I mean, I can see why that's a hit. Well, and the equipment is so technical. It's... Uh, completely different than when I grew up and, and you know, not even in the same uh, category at all as my father. Uh, now, you know, the seed drills, you hit a button and it steers straight down the field with the GPS, uh, you know, twice the width and within inches of being accurate. Wow. Uh, and you don't touch the steering wheel till you get to the end turn. You know, so it, it's much more technical, um, much more uh, perhaps aggressive and uh, serious business, uh, and uh, I, that's not a bad thing. That's a good yeah. thing. Productivity is much better. So, are you saying that since farming wasn't necessarily your passion, that when the political option came along, you thought, "All right, this is a good one"? No, farming is always my passion. The best day that I can put in right now is, uh, you know, helping my son on a day of combining. I get, you know, I think I was on a combine a couple, three days this year. Uh, those are the best days, uh, really. And when I go back, uh, you know, I'm very close to what's happening on the farm, although I can't help out very much because of my time. But, sure. But uh, so passion-wise, that's not the issue. Uh, what yeah. drove, me, drove me to politics wasn't that I was excited about politics. In fact, I tell people I can't stand politics, but I'm passionate about good government. That's, okay. My, okay. that's my line. Different and things. and uh, we are doing some great things uh, for this country. Uh, what we're doing on the international trade front right now and capitalizing on opportunities for generations to come are are things that I think Canadians uh, will reap tremendous benefit in years to come, but um, maybe don't appreciate quite yet. Tell me about the impact that your decision to go into politics had on your family. Yeah, it's a team effort. My wife uh, was very supportive, or I wouldn't do it. Um, the kids were in university, so you know that left some freedom uh, to allow me to move into uh, you know politics at this level. But um, I'm one of the fortunate ones. My wife. Uh, does look after. She does a tremendous amount of work in helping with, uh, you know, books. Uh, a couple of corporations that we have, but then uh, when we, she she can travel with me and does travel with me, and she's here now, and so. Oh, nice. Uh, that makes some sanity of the job. Yeah. And, uh, makes it work well. Does she come up often to Ottawa? I, as much as I can talk her into it. That's but it's, great. Uh, it's just combobulating. Be, yeah, you you really uh, can drift apart, as yes. and we've seen you know examples of that with some of my colleagues and yeah. others. But uh, you know, we've determined that that's not going to be the case, and uh, we're very deliberate about that. And I don't apologize for it. And yeah. It's a thrill to have her with me, and it's a team effort. Is it possible for her to make friends in Ottawa outside of the political <clears throat> spectrum, or is it such a circumscribed uh, environment just because of your own schedule that? Well, well, she can, but she's not here that terribly much. Right. So it's more difficult for her because she isn't uh, back at home mm -hmm. uh, all the time, so she loses connections there and doesn't. Uh, and, and is sort of half-connected here, so right. she's half-connected both places, which is much more difficult uh, for her than it is for myself even. Yeah. Um, I understand that, and I, we try to accommodate that as much as possible, but she's a trooper. How did you meet her? We met her in college. Okay. Okay. So uh, we uh, we actually were engaged very quickly. I mean, we, we were friends in college, but uh, actually on our third date, I think we were engaged. Is that right? Who initiated that? Well, the women always do the asking. They just don't verbalize it, you know? <laughs> 
So she quietly suggested that you should be asking? <laughs> no. no, I She sounds I like wanna, a diplomat. <laughs> I wouldn't want to say that. Yeah, it's, uh, we, uh, we actually met young, fell in love, grew up together, and I um, uh, it's worked extremely well. Actually, both of our sons were married quite young, and uh, we have five grandchildren. It's uh, a Do lot of fun. Really? That's great. What do your grand grandchildren think about your job? Or do they just think it's totally normal, as children tend to? Uh, it's funny. No, I tease them all the time, and it's a lot of fun because three of them are right across uh, the creek from us. Okay. We liberate on the same sort of yard. Right. Uh, so it's, you know, it's great fun. And the other uh, son is a professional forester. He's just um, you know, an hour, a little over an hour away. So we see them a lot. We travel a lot together. But they, the kids, we tease them all the time. They... I mean, to, to me, I'm just Papa. And, oh, is that what uh, they call you, Papa? Yeah, so I, okay. I, I, I tease him sometimes. I say, you know, you have to call me Honorable Papa. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we just have a lot of fun together, and it's great. That's terrific. You apparently um, do some kind of parachuting. Power parachute. Yeah. Power pa what, is, what is that? Well, that's a, it's like a dune buggy with a motor and a prop and a parachute uh, Above it, uh, so when you come back out to visit Yellowhead, I'll okay. take you for a ride. Okay, you get to take yeah. your power take you, Yeah, absolutely. Do you have room for two? Yeah, just a two-seater, okay. helmets and uh, intercom system, so we uh, you can fly around. You can fly ten thousand feet near the air if you like. But can you really? Yeah, but the most fun is you know treetop level. Uh, you know, double that, maybe under five hundred, under a thousand feet. Uh, everything higher than that just gets smaller. Do you have a death wish flying no, no. in a dune buggy with a parachute, or is it the safest flying machine in the world? Is, uh, it, is it truly, or do you just? I I've been flying for is. 15 years. I've never had an incident. How did you get into it? I saw it on television. I thought that would be a great fit for you know our farm and where we were at. Uh, and then I was at a trade show, and they were selling them, and they came out. And uh, within a week, I was uh, I was uh, had one was flying, so it was great. So explain to me how <clears throat> it works. You're in the dune buggy type contraction and do you have to kind of race down a level no, I, field or yeah if you're in a level field uh, as you accelerate you accelerate quite quickly and and the parachute fills up it has cells about a foot deep um, once your parachute is full it uh, you get a tremendous amount of lift and it'll lift you know 900 pounds and you'll be airborne within 100 150 yards wow yeah. that must be quite something it's a lot of fun do you have constituents come out just to watch you do it? Yeah, quite often when you're flying, you'll have people that will pull over and just watch. <laughs> I bet they do. Yeah. yeah, that could also be a great auction item for fundraising. Yeah, that's right. You could put a sign on it or something. Yes. I've never used that. The yeah. campaign team have said, well, maybe you should try that sometime. You absolutely but, should. But we get great support in our riding, so we, uh, we don't have to get tricky. Okay. <laughs> Does your wife go up with you? Uh, yes, pack. I scared her one time, and she doesn't fly with me much anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> because you're a daredevil, or because uh, no, it was a windy day, it was lots of thermals, and it bounced around a little bit. And <clears throat> her knees started trembling a little bit. She got a little bit nervous. Yeah, I, I think that would do it to me. Yeah, so uh, so I'm, I, I'm, you know, she she will come up with me, but uh, she doesn't enjoy it like I enjoy it. Sure. You talked a little bit um, earlier. We talked jokingly about. House of Commons being an asylum. <laughs> Despite uh, God, uh, yeah, those words will get me on sure. <laughs> no, because I think a lot of Canadians <clears throat> probably agree with you, but um, it, it is a busy place and there is a lot going on and um, frankly there is a lot of yelling that happens during during question period. So it's a pretty apt description. But um, do you like it? Um, I'm not excited about question period um, because that's theater for a uh, Ugly people is described by some people, uh, but it has a purpose. Uh, that's not. That's not. I mean, that's what Canadians see, but that's not really what Ottawa is about. Um, for me, Ottawa is about moving the country forward in a way that collectively is in the best interest of the country, and that is something that is a very serious thing. Um, the, the work that we do in committee, sometimes it gets political. You have to look above the politics of it and understand the politics of it. But you, ideas are a dime a dozen around here. You have the, the magic of the place is moving the idea to implementation, and that happens through consensus building, which is really more about relationships. So you have to have uh, credible relationships with your peop with peers. Those peers have to see the issue that you're driving as being credible and you being a credible uh, adversary for that idea. 
that's, so the politics here is not about I moving ideas, it's about how you move the idea. Uh, Washington is, runs more even than Ottawa on relationships. So uh, I guess in, in Washington, the work that I do with, uh, with Congress, it's 100% it's relationship. And uh, if you do it right, you do it genuinely, uh, it's amazing what you can get done. Do you find that it's um, difficult to develop and maintain relationships in a political environment? Well, they're somewhat fickle, but uh, you, over a period of time, you, you, know, you see others and others see you as either a credible person, somebody who works hard, does their job, and knows what they're talking about, or, or not. Mm -hmm. um, I would say there are people in all parties that are perceived as being more self-serving than altruistic in, in the way they approach a job. Um, you know, my my view has never been about being aggressively pursuing my own interest uh, and getting in front of a camera. That's not my goal. My goal is to do what I can to help the country and, and to serve the riding that I represent as aggressively and as positively as possible, and that's really where I'm at. The, the partisanship atmosphere um, that many say permeates um, politics at any level, is that something that affects you? I mean, are you able to bridge those partisan divides? Do you? Um, I think a lot of Canadians would think that each party sticks to its own ranks and that there isn't much communication with other members of parties. Is that true? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I just assume that regardless of which party you're with, that you come to this place with the best of intentions for the people you represent and the country as a whole, albeit the direction that other parties are going, I would vehemently disagree with and I, I voice that. But that doesn't mean that personally that that's an issue. Okay, uh, so you so could disagree with a colleague. Absolutely, and then have coffee with okay. them. Uh, so uh, we we do that all the time. I mean, I'll be in Japan next week, and I'll be with uh, the NDP and the Liberal parties, and uh, these are great individuals. But I disagree strongly with the position they would like to take the country because I think it's the wrong direction. Uh, uh, so, but you can't personalize it. You have to see two things. One is that. That's the position the person takes, but that's not the person. The person is a very genuinely good person and a okay. good Canadian, even though their position might be much different than yours. What's, what's your best day um, here in Ottawa on the House of Commons? I mean, what, what for you typifies a, a really good day? Well, I, I love what I'm, what I'm doing. If you, um, I mean, your best day is when actually you can get something moved, something done. Um, so those are the best days, and right now we're majority government, so we have the opportunity to actually implement uh, legislation and move agenda along much better than ever did when we were in minority right. government or you know, when you're in opposition. Yeah. So uh, it, is, uh, it is wonderful to see those things happen, and you feel accomplished in, in that you know, all of the work is coming to uh, some good. Uh, what I, my best day actually, I would say 50% of my time is, is really focused in on the American Congress, so I, I really do work aggressively with them. And that's it's a great day when you can move something in America, like uh, getting into the TPP, a Trans-Pacific Partnership, something I worked aggressively at. It's great to see it come together, not to say that I was the one who did it, uh, but you certainly contributed to it. And, sure. And they brought some players together to make that happen. So those are the, those are the best days. What about the difference between the minority and majority status? Because you've seen it. You've been here long enough now that you served in minority parliaments and now you're in a majority parliament. What's the difference for you? The power players are different in a mi minority. If you're, if you're in a minority, um, uh, you, you know, the, the power play happens in committee much more. In a majority, uh, you know, you're going to win every vote. So your power plays, you know, happen uh, more, in, more in caucus, uh, more in dealing with ministers that are actually driving the, you know, the, the pieces of legislation and how you can move that agenda along. So you have to discern where, where the power players are and then impact those decision makers as you move forward. Uh, it's the same thing in Washington, I, whether it's Buy America clauses or TPP or the thinning the border down. You know, who are the decision makers in Congress? Identify who they are and, and address them, uh, address the issues with them. That's, uh, that's really how you make things happen. Uh, and it's very rewarding if you do it right because it's not about you and it's not about anything other than driving the issue and uh, it becomes very rewarding when you see things happen. 
So you've talked about the travel that you do, not just back and forth to the writing, but um, the, the travel that's related to the work that you do. And you have a busy schedule on the Hill as well. Do you have time um, when you're in Ottawa uh, that you can actually relax, or is it a, a pure business environment for you? Uh, when my wife is here, I try to you know, trim down the evening so that I'm not out or if I am out that I hopefully will have her along with me so that yeah, you spend that makes sense. a little bit of time with her and that, that adds some sanity to the position. Um, uh, now she's not here maybe 50% of the time but right. the day starts about 7 in the morning and you're, if you're home by 8 or 8.30 uh, in the evening you're, that's an early day. Um, so it is aggressive and quite often there's not you know, time for lunch but uh, or dinner. Yeah, or dinner <laughs> but uh, nonetheless it just depends on the day. Um, I don't I don't mind that. I enjoy being busy. I like being I like being aggressive and doing things uh, to to the optimum. So yeah. uh, I wouldn't do it any other way. Uh, Was, I farm the same way. Did you? <laughs> yeah. Did you? So you? It's kind of just the approach <clears throat> then. It's you. You can approach it. However, if you're not giving it a hundred percent, then then you're looking for something else. Right. Yeah. Was federal politics what you expected of it when you arrived here? Um, uh, you, it takes you three, four years before you're really playing offense. When you first come, you think, well, I can learn the procedures and the rules and you know, play uh, the game as good as anyone else, if you don't look at it that way. But uh, it does take you three or four years to build a reputation and build credibility and uh, get the kind of, um, have the discernment that you need to be able to actually drive the issues. You are serving in a house now with a lot of really young people. Um, has that changed the tone of the house? I think a lot of these young people are in a very, very aggressive learning curve. And at first they came in, they were quite loud. Now they're subdued a little more because I think they realize that they know now more what they don't know. Right. And so uh, the, the house, I think, is, is functional. We're able to move things along. Um, uh, you know, at the very beginning of this election, it was it was more difficult. There were some issues that you know took a lot more noise, a lot more uh, uh, let's say combative uh, atmosphere. But I think things are uh, even being more functional right now. I'm really grateful that you took the time to be here today. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. I know you have a busy schedule, so we'll uh, let you get on with your day. But thank you. Thank you very much. Well, you need to come back and uh, enjoy Yellowhead. To. I would yeah. love to come back to Yellowhead, yeah. and I'll, I'll make a plan of doing that, and I will take out life insurance for when I fly <laughs> in this buggy thing with you. Your uh, power You won't need it. Safe as flying. Okay, machine. perfect. I'll talk good. to your wife first. Oh, uh, yeah. That's fine. Okay. Very good. Thank Great you very much, Rob Mayfield. Mm -hmm.